among national branding campaigns, local projects, personal experiments, and illustrations. So please join me in welcoming to Heads of State. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. What about that guy? <coughs> Sometimes in our bio it says 15 years, but it's 17 years. <laughs> Time to hang it up. <laughs> um, we should go back a bit though. Let's like, you know, design school. Well, we did this too, right? We were in your shoes. Let's go back a bit. So we met, we met together at Tyler School of Art. Yep. Uh, art school in the late 90s. A very particular thing. A very particular thing. Everybody looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> Dodging grits. Slow motion. Dusty had like a chainmail trench coat that he wore to class all the time. Uh, but all the graphic design at that time looked like this. At least it felt like it looked like that. Uh, super glossy. People were just sort of like drunk on Photoshop. People figuring out computers, uh, making things really shiny. Hung over from David Carson and, and stuff like that. Um, deconstructed type, no rules. And we just, it was just not our thing. We've actually really grown to appreciate a lot of that stuff. I think as you get some distance from it, you can appreciate it. But when you're young and you're in it, we hate it. And we really wanted to figure out a way to work together uh, and make stuff by hand, make things a little bit messier. Um, this was the kind of stuff we were into. I, I don't think we even sort of knew what graphic design was at the time, uh, which can be common when you sort of enter into it. You sort of have your, your parents' idea of what a career in graphic design is, and then you figure out what, what it actually is and what it can you. But this is the stuff we were interested in. And then when you get to design school and you look at some design history, you start to realize that there was some pretty awesome stuff that was made in the, in the 60s and 70s that looked a lot like this. Uh, the Saul Bass stuff, Paul Rand, and so Dusty and I, after we graduated, had this kind of wacky idea that like, maybe we could put you know, these two things together um, and make some really fun posters for our friends and for bands and our friends that were in bands, things like that. Right? And that's what we did uh, for, for a long time. Uh, screen printed posters, two or three color, and we would try to sell these things at shows in Philadelphia uh, to try to make back a little bit of money. 50 bucks here and there. It was, it was really just us having fun after working, kind of experimenting, trying to, to figure out new styles and just trying to push ourselves kind of forward. We've been doing this for um, about two, two years. I know what the next slide is. Do we want to talk a little bit, maybe not about the band, but about the, the story to let these guys know that sometimes it's just kind of chance and luck and not just we probably should. us being amazing designers? Um, I think it's because the rest of the lecture is us being amazing designers. <laughs> I, I think it's probably worth noting that this was a thing that was kind of happening in graphic design at the time. There, this was, there, were, there were a lot of designers we admired that were making posters. Um, and we started to get into this as like a scene. There would be art shows all about it, there would be conferences all about posters. Um, and yes, luck sometimes is on the side. So um, we'd been doing this for about two years and decided to go down to the South by Southwest, which is a big music conference and festival down in Austin. And that year they were having like an art show, poster show, so we figured we'd pack our stuff up, go down there and sell it. We had a good time down there, saw some shows, sold some posters. Um, the last day we were just kind of walking around Austin. Um, and fact, this is no joke, on the side of the, was it in a garbage can or just kind of like by the gutter, like top of the garbage can? 
there was this big phone book size thing, which ended up being, I don't know who threw it away, somebody should probably get fired, but like contact information for all the, the bands and band management that was registered for, for South by Southwest that day. And it was just tons and tons of people, and it's like, Bruce Springsteen, here's, here's the email address, his manager, and all, all this stuff, like thousands and thousands of names. So we took it back to Philly. Well, so we, we did, it. did we try to get, we didn't try to find the rightful owner? I think maybe for a second we were like, oh, somebody's really in trouble. And then we're right in the suitcase, right in the car. So we took it back home and kind of pulled all the money we had made from, from posters at the time, which to us felt like we were rich, but it was probably only about 500 bucks. Decided we were going to make a little booklet, direct mailer, that was going to go out to all these bands and the band managers. And we were just, you know, picking out yachts. We knew this was going to be the, we were just going to make tons of money. This was, this was, this was their meal. What, what's the average, um, like, what's the return on direct mail? What do they say? Like 10%? 10% return on direct mail. And here we have, like, so, you know, 1,000 managers, top-notch names, top Bruce show. Springsteen's address and everything. Just send out this promo for me and be rich and sit back. But we got one reply, so probably like a 0.5% return. But lucky for us, it was it was Wilco's management. And at the time, again, really dating ourselves. This is 17, 18 years ago now. See, you changed the number. <laughs> sure, sure not. Um, they were huge at the time, so it was just a boon for us to be able to, to work with them. I think at all told we probably did like 20 or 30 posters for them. Yeah, it was sort of um, really unique at the time. Like even though posters were really happening in graphic design, there weren't that many bands that were commissioning graphic designers to make stuff. And Wilco was just one of those bands that really cared about their audience, and cared, cared about connecting with the audience. They were one of the first bands that streamed their albums. Um, and so they hired us and other people too to just make this stuff and sell as merch on their site to just sort of connect with, with the fans. And um, you have to do like two or three album cycles with 25, 30 posters, I'm not sure. Um, do we want to talk about these posters at all? Or just not? I mean, I guess, I guess it's like there, some of them, you're into the band or you're into, the, you know, some of them can be like in jokes about certain lyrics. Some of them can be about the city. I think when you crank out a lot of these things, it can be hard to figure out you know, what that imagery is, it's part of the fun. It can also start to become sort of part of the grind and sort of make it feel a little bit arbitrary. That might be a good yeah. segment. Oh, no. We, no, no, it's, it's good. We did a lot of these posters. That's the same. Yeah, yeah. Sonic Youth, Ariana, I mean, that Wilco just kind of spawned with a bunch of a bunch of other clients. But I, I think that what we were noticing as you were kind of going to get into is it was fun, it was really experimental. I, I, I have to know at the time, we didn't necessarily think that we wanted to be a full-time graphic design studio. The, the end of what we wanted to do was just have fun and maybe get some extra money. Um, and it did start to feel a little bit arbitrary. Um, we certainly were having fun, but there wasn't much meat to these posters. Um, it felt like you could do a poster for the detachment kit with a, a polar bear in a cage, but that could also be for the hold steady, or that polar bear is getting really pissed off, it's rage against the machine poster. It really started to be this kind of feeling of, we can just kind of slap stuff on there. Um, and, and for us, I think that we were realizing, do you want to go back to the, to the Wilco page? That on this particular Wilco poster, we started to, it was like one of the first times where we actually thought like, it's not about the band, but we're going to do, they're going to do this big show in DC. It was at the height of the second Iraq war. George Bush was being a shithead. Um, and we said, well, maybe we can just make a, a political statement or a social statement. And it's a simple one. It's, it's you know, a piece of ivy going up the, going up the, um, the Washington Monument. But, but I think with all our posters, that idea of simplicity and the message really became important to us. And we, when we hit on this one, like, oh, this kind of feels like we're doing something bigger than just making some disposable garbage for bands. Um, Let's see this polar bear again. <laughs> Disposable garbage for bands. I think that that poster that Dusty's talking about, it, it, it won a couple of awards for us. Slide in that. That's it. Should, shouldn't have gone back. It won a couple of awards for us. I think it sort of made our name a little bit as a studio. We, we still had full-time jobs at, at 
this point. This was like a side project at night, something we were doing, you know, just to stay creative, to stay fresh. Um, but it really did give us um, a bit of a larger audience. And art directors started calling, book publishers, illustration art directors to commission us. And so we were able to do uh, the same kind of aesthetic, the same visual problem solving, but instead of for a band, we do it for a book cover, we do it for an article. Um, and that kind of gave us this career that we didn't really see coming. Yeah, there's not much difference between these two pieces other than, you know, one doesn't have type and still works. It's a 10th anniversary of September 11th. And one is a book cover with beautiful type, very similar to the, to the concept books. And so that, that kind of change for us was, I don't want to say simple, but it was kind of simple um, when, it, when it happened. It probably felt a little hard at the time just because I don't think that we ever considered ourselves illustrators. We had always kind of considered ourselves designers. Why would you want us to illustrate a magazine article? We were graphic designers. But knowing that we didn't have to pick up the paintbrush and come in and do what we were doing um, and make those illustrations our own way was a real kind of epiphany. So we had a company. That's sort of what happened. You know, we got attention and started to make stuff. We had a company, unintentional design studio. And we did not want to just do music posters. Um, we really wanted to figure out a way to put all this stuff together. Uh, graphic design, illustration, writing, branding. And that's kind of what we do now, is put all that stuff together. Because we like to call it, um, I still, I skip your head. Great place to work. We have great clients. We should have rehearsed this thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a really good plan. We like finished this lecture yesterday, and I had to leave work early. And then he texted me last night. I was like, I had like 15 new slides. <laughs> We're just kind of waiting. Uh, no, I think in the, in the time we have been together, from transitioning from band posters and illustration, we've been able to work with some really amazing clients, some really great brands. We're really proud of that. Um, we've won a bunch of design awards, and we talked a little bit about that. These are not those, right? Um, design awards are so sharp, and so dangerous looking, and so pretentious. We like to stay grounded and stay humble, and you know, care about the things that really matter. Um, so, to sum it all up, Okay, our, our intro story, how we got here. This is really what we try to do every day, which is designed for people by a couple of people. That, that's sort of how we describe ourselves. And uh, we've done some of these kinds of lectures before. We know you guys have seen some of them. is going to come here, and the lecture is going to grow out of a chair, and the type is going to snake up the wall. We, we want to try to impart upon you some advice. We don't want this to just be about look at how amazing we are. Okay? So we, we have some things that we call rules to work by, and we want to take you through some of that, give you some advice, okay? Um, what's, what's, like, what's like the first, how, I, I guess we, these are sort of like obvious wisdoms, right? The kind of thing that everybody agrees upon and nods your head about, and you give a friend some advice, but we forget about them when we're busy, or we forget about them when we're tired, so we just kind of want to remind you about them. The first rule to work by that, that means a lot to us. Every place is a shit show. You have to find the shit show that is right for you. <laughs> as in work, same as in life. This is just true. This is a real thing. Right? I mean, the shit show thing is pretty important. <coughs> I think doing this for 15 years, we realized that nobody really knows what's going on. It's just that, you know, every, everybody is, is a little bit of a mess. It's just some people project it and kind of fake it a little bit more. Um, this is our shit show. This is our shit show. <laughs> Got five of them. It's great, and we, we've, uh, over the, the course of, what are we agreeing on, 17 years? 17. We've been two people, we've been up to eight. Five feels really good right now. Um, it, we're able to continue to do the work. Um, you get too many people in there, you start to be in a management position. And I still think, though it's been 17 years, we still got some creative juices in us. So the idea that we can manage but also still stay hands-on is really important to us. More so than, I think, growing and, and getting these giant clients that would mean getting a, a bigger studio. Five people being able to be hands-on and creative direct and, and, and be able to make things is really important. I think this team right now um, is really great because of what they bring to the table. Kara, uh, she actually went to Penn State. Uh, maybe graduated four or five years ago. Um, she's our senior designer, she's amazing. Brings uh, a little bit more of a soft feminine touch um, to, to our stuff. Um, Brandon uh, graduated from Tyler, he's great because he is down to do anything. 
I think every studio needs that. We didn't have them for a while, and it was like everybody was a little bit of a prima donna, like they didn't want to finish up the files or didn't want to. Uh, he's great, and I think because of that, like we trust him a little bit more. So he's been able to grow because he's shown us that he's down for anything. We're going to give him more. Yeah, Eric complains, just does it. Yeah, gets it done. It's great. Senya? Senya's been with us now. Uh, she's entering her fourth year of working with us. She studied finance in Moscow, went to Tyler for graphic design, totally changed her career around, and uh, is just like this wonderful hybrid designer illustrator. Keeps us abreast of fashion trends. And Home decor and restaurants, music, music, yeah. Uh, other two dudes are our guys. <laughs> Do I get to say this one? Yes, it's yours. <laughs> if you're having an identity crisis, make the crisis your identity. Now, now Jay, I have to admit, <laughs> you made this slide, and I think you, you uh, did you. <coughs> Who's having the identity crisis? Is it us, or is it the client that we're going to talk about? Or is it maybe you're a genius and it's both? It's I both. I'll speak to both of them. So. Genius. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> the truth, the identity, is, the truth identity. is, we came up with this <laughs> as a way to talk about languages. We, talk, we came up with this to talk about us, because we do design and illustration. And that's been tricky to sort of juggle that. But then we started to realize that because we do so many different things, clients come to us who need a lot of different the identity crisis that we have when it comes down to this is we want to be designers, we want to illustrate, and we want to make great type, and how do you master all of them? And sometimes, 99% of the times you can't, but when you can, um, I think you just, when you find the client that's going to let you just kind of go with it, then just tell them exactly what you're going to be doing and, and just kind of own it. Um, the issue with the, the identity crisis that the folks from the Bureau of Brewing were having was they're in a space with the microbreweries that is just kind of overloaded. You know, it's beautiful design across the uh, across the spectrum. How could they kind of carve out a, a niche in, with a brand um, that was going to stand out on the shelves? And our decision for them, but also to keep kind of us placated, was forget about the brand. We'll play it down a little bit. The, the brand is the chaos of all the type and experimentation and all the fun that you can have. Um, They've been a great client. It's one of these clients where we're never going to make a million bucks off of them. We do about three to four cans a week, um, which seems a little bit crazy when we actually kind of three years. <coughs> what's that? For three years. Yeah. So we've literally done maybe like 250 cans. Um, we It's a lot. It's, it's kind of crazy, but if you think of it in the, the scheme of the studio as a whole, being able to take a break and just we decided we're only going to put like three to four hours into each can, so it turns into this fun little experiment. They love it. They're super easy to work with, so whatever we say, they usually will push back once in a while. But it's a, it's a way to experiment and just kind of to have fun um, and to kind of keep fresh, experiment with type, uh, where some of our larger clients not really able to do that. Something I just really believe in, right? <laughs> this is sort of another way of saying what makes you weird is what makes you good, what makes you interesting. Embracing your inner weird, I think. We were pretty dorky about music posters, dorky about the bands we liked. People really responded to that. Um, we've been lucky to get projects that are kind of band poster adjacent, um, whether it's repertory, cin repertory cinema or theater posters. In this case, uh, this is for the Academy Awards for screening uh, Shasha and Redemption. Pretty much a band poster that has that kind of cinematic moodiness to it. Pretty dorky. What's the, go back, what's, I haven't seen Shawshank Redemption in like 15 years. Uh, 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> what is the, is the chess piece like a little? He carves, uh, he carves a chess board out of stone with his rock hammer. He tries to write his initials. Why don't I spill them? I'm making a noise over here. Sorry. Does he carves his initials? He carves his, uh, yeah, he does leave it. Let's leave it at that. Spoil it. It's not like it's the six months. Uh, here's some pretty dorky uh, <coughs> posters for Carrie the Musical and for uh, Ian Esco's Bald Soprano, pretty dorky stuff. Now, we did this stuff for, for fun, for passion projects, not a lot of money, for local clients, or whatever. Uh, but it, it really paved the way and, and led us to, I think, this project by the Postal Service for the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. Um, they came to us because they needed to find somebody who could solve a problem in a small space 
and turn uh, a, commemorative post, a commemorative postage stamp into a poster. Uh, so that was kind of the whole brief for this. Uh, the United States Postal Service has in-house art directors, which is kind of fascinating. Um, some are in-house, actually. Some are little studios that they work with in the D.C. area. <laughs> so is there like a board of like eight people who just kind of yep, there's a board different. and they look at the slate for the year and they decide who they want to work with and who they, they want to hire. And those art directors make those decisions. Um, 18 rounds of revisions with the federal government on these projects. <laughs> how, how long was that? It was about 13 months, start to finish. At round five, we found out we couldn't use any likeness of any of the actors. CBS would not allow the, the government to do that. CBS, more powerful than the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to start over, but yeah, 18 rounds. This is, you know, these projects don't happen all the time. This is one where, like, your grandmother understands what you do finally. A lot of those runs, though, were, like, minutia in that we don't necessarily are. This is about the size that we always design in, like, that, that rectangle, um, whether it's book covers or, or illustrations or posters. But a lot of it was back and forth about, well, this thing's only an inch tall. You have to make these details twice as big or simplify it, stuff that we had never even thought about it. Well, we stopped by a class today, a sophomore class, to talk about logos. And that question came up about scale. Uh, how small does it have to be? And I, there was definitely three or four rounds that were all about, hey, this looks great on my computer screen. Good job, guys. When I put it on a letter, not as interesting, right? So that sort of reductive process of making it simple, minimalist, but still have a lot of energy and feel like a poster and feel like a Star Trek. Um, you also so have, did you have the te other text on there at one point for a long while. Live long and prosper. Yeah, for a while. That was one or two. Sucks that they took that off. But was that like a licensing thing? CBS wasn't feeling that either. We needed the space actually. It's kind of There's some more books. Um, something I really believe in. Okay. You want to understand? Not all sandwiches are pretty equal. They all do the job. <coughs> Some are trying to say, this guy, anybody know this guy? It's super weird, super dorky. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Warren Zeeman? Still nobody knows. Still nobody knows. <laughs> uh, dearly departed Warren Zeeman on his deathbed. When looking back on his life, he said, enjoy every sandwich. Uh, I think it's pretty wise. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, in a career, whether it's 15 years or 17 years or 10 years or whatever it is, you have some you have some high points, some really high moments, and you have to appreciate them when they come. Uh, this was something we did for the New York Times Sunday Magazine after Obama's inauguration. What was it the first Sunday after the inauguration? First Sunday after the inauguration. A uh, huge assignment for us. You know, we were still sort of trying to make our name for ourselves, and this is one of those kind of projects that comes along and <coughs> breaks it wide open for you. We've since done tons of stuff in the New York Times, which we'll, we'll talk about. And you can see some of it in the gallery show. But, man, those eight years went quick. And before you know it, you're, you're illustrating the same kind of client, same kind of project, same kind of process for a very different kind of guy. So enjoy the <coughs> sandwich, even the bad ones. As a graphic designer, I think you're going to have weird assignments, you're going to have good ones. Uh, you still have to find some joy in the process itself. We go back to the Obama cover. So we don't do a lot of portraiture at all. I, I think if you asked us to draw Barack's face, it'd be a complete failure. It would not look like anything like the president. So I think one of the hardest parts about this is such a prestigious um, publication to be on the cover of, especially uh, for the, the first issue in, in Obama's um, first term. term. But we're like, how the fuck are we going to? They said, he's got to be on there. Like, and I think we tried a lot of things. That was a requirement. They said, whatever you do for the paper, you have to have Obama on there. And we realized, so this is actually me. My wife took a picture of me holding a broom or something. And then we realized that the, um, the quintessential thing that is Barack Obama is just the ears. So we photoshopped my, my hair up and just put the, the pop of the ear on there. 
And I don't know. It feels like it's like just enough where you kind of just like, oh yeah, that's him, no problem. It's just the years. So just kind of figuring out those little things and figuring out ways to like circumvent the stuff that you can't do but, but still make it work um, is pretty fun. Stressful to too. Yeah, um, we have done a lot of work uh, for the New York Times. I think one of the craziest parts of, of doing work for them is your, your, your phone lights up and it's always the same number. It's like this literally one, 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 and you, you kind of just know it's the New York Times. And uh, if it's a Tuesday afternoon before you pick that up, you know they're going to need uh, the sketches in three hours and the final work three hours after that. So these kind of ridiculous deadlines, um, we definitely not picked up the phone sometimes when we just knew there was no way in hell that we were going to be able to fit that in that day. But um, you, had, you had mentioned earlier today that idea that, yeah, they're not. It's agonizing when they call because you want to do it. You know, It's usually a great article. It's something you usually believe in and you like want to, you want to get your work out there and speak to that cause. But it is going to mess up your day, your night, maybe the next day. And I complained about it to a fellow, a fellow illustrator. And they said to me, uh, they don't call. They don't call people who aren't busy. Like that's the challenge. It's the challenge is figuring out how to do a good job on top of whatever else you're doing. They don't call people who are just sitting around uh, with nothing to do. So it kind of becomes a point of pride. It becomes a way to sort of sharpen your, you know, sharpen the knife and uh, see if you still got it and uh, roll the dice and see what kind of Tuesday you want to have. <laughs> I think also that that time constraint really forces you to, to learn how to just iterate and think as quickly as possible. And I think that goes along with just our design style of trying to keep it simple, to <laughs> reduce it all down to, to simple shapes and simple ideas. So I, I, don't, I think that that one is about um, demilitarizing Guantanamo Bay, um, so figuring out how to show Cuba in a way that, that is universally known, shows star, and then obviously the militarization of, of, uh, of Guantanamo Bay and the, and the, uh, the razor wire. It's also an opportunity when you know they're not going to, they, they already are giving you the contract that's due in six hours, so you can kind of get away with doing whatever you want. So sometimes it's an opportunity to just kind of have fun and explore different styles. So they give him this thing at the end of the day, it's an opportunity for you to, we don't do figures a lot, so I think this one was, was an opportunity just like, let's figure out how to do that, and if they're going to run it, it's going to be printed. Hopefully it's going to be good. Explore different styles. Explore different simplicities. I totally forget what it looks like. About to find out. Okay. This is, you don't like, but you, you didn't, you're confused by this one. Yeah, I get it now, but you, cool. you don't want to skip it over? Go for it. Beware, strangers with candy. We're really, we're really lucky to have a lot of great clients. Um, we get emails every day, uh, every week. Um, we have to kind of, and I think everybody should treat those new business inquiries as strangers with candy, because it all sounds really good in their little email, but there's something, something that's going to be a little weird in there. It's, they're going to try to trap you. It, it's not always amazing. This particular stranger with candy was a um, art director at Universal Records that we were really uh, stoked to work with. He had done a lot of album covers that we were super excited about and sent an email and said, I've got a, a national legend that I'd love you guys to work on. We're going to have an album. It's going to be his comeback album. He didn't tell us who it was. Oh, yeah, national legend. Let's do it. Is it going to be Willie Nelson? Is it Bob Dylan? Johnny Cash? No, it's Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis. Who, you don't know this, but well, maybe you do. Maybe you're a huge Johnny Mathis. Are you? I was on his Wikipedia preparing for this. Portion of the speech. He's the third <coughs> selling artist in US history, 360 million albums. Are you shocked? I never would have guessed that. <laughs> so, all right, it's not the American legend we thought we were going to work with. It's Johnny Mathis, but I've heard the name, not sure if I could sing a song. He's I'll, like half the albums are Christmas albums. Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> this was not a Christmas album. Uh, we found out that he wanted to do a, an album of Nashville standards, uh, country music, and was going to call it Johnny in Nashville. Nashville. 
awesome, that sounds pretty cool. We can get back into this. We'll do some hatch uh, show prints or some wood, wood cut type or yeah. press or something. And, and I said, Johnny's manager said, cool, I'm going to send over a picture that you would really love to have on the cover. Awesome. Tell Johnny to send that picture over. We'd love to, to work with whatever he's, he, he's got going. For his, for his album, Johnny in Nashville. Are you guys familiar with Nashville? <laughs> Grand, the, the, it's not in the desert. It's not in the desert. Not, it's, it's not in Tennessee. <laughs> so we kind of pushed back a little bit and said, maybe Johnny's losing it. We know he's, he's getting up there in, in age in his late 70s. Really, can we go with something else? Because this does not say Johnny in Nashville. The manager says, gentlemen, do not worry. Yeah. We were just in the studio. We had a total pro LA photographer right there the whole time documenting Johnny in all of his production glory. Wait till you see these pictures. It's going to oh. be great. It's going to make a great album cover. Send it over. This is going to be great. He's going to be just sold to the microphone. This is literally <laughs> I don't even think that he's awake in this case with sneakers. Is that there case with uh, or something? I don't know. I, I didn't uh, look into it that much. There's like nothing on the book even. This isn't mine. All right. So last email. We got. We got to listen. Jo Johnny Mathis' manager. Is there anything we can use here? Because this stuff is just unusable. He said, let me, let me, I've got some personal photos, got some horse whispering photos of Johnny. Where it gets to Nick? Yeah. So we kind of wrote back to the, to the manager and said, oh, this? We can totally turn this into an album cover. Johnny Nash. <laughs> that's, the, that's the album cover. We had to put that horse thing on there. So, got to make it work. I, honestly, looking back, I still think this stranger with candy, we still would have said yes to it, but it's a, it's a lesson in that it's not always what it seems. We actually just kind of, um, I can't believe like that's a, um, there's, if you Google it, there's like signed versions that I kind of really want to like bid on. <laughs> we would never, like this is not going our portfolio. <laughs> it was that idea that we're going to work with this, this renowned art director at the record company and Maybe we'll do the Johnny Mathis album, but, but, but maybe he'll give us more projects. Why? When you do this, he's not, they're not calling back to <laughs> That was the last time we worked with Universal Records. We just, uh, we were talking about Strangers with Candy, I feel like we just um, had one of the biggest Strangers with Candy uh, moments with one of our former clients, as it were. And it was the perfect email, it was a local Philly business that we were really familiar with, really stoked to work with. Um, said all the right things in the email, met with him in person, got along gangbusters. It was like one of the best person-to-person -person client meetings that we had had. Um, going back to the strangers with candy kind of um, idea, he brought us into his van. No, 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 when you... <laughs> When we talk to these clients, we have, one of the questions we always ask them is, who's the decision maker? And he said that he was the decision maker. Well, the stranger with candy brought us back to the van, and it was a clown car of decision makers in there. He, we showed him first round, second round stuff, and he was showing the stuff to his girlfriend, his, literally his parents, other design firms. Um, a retired ad agency guy? Everybody probably should have. Yeah, did you guys see it? <laughs> you guys might have seen it. Strangers with candy, just be aware. The clients are usually good. There's always some kind of trickery going on. That's it. I, I, we both teach and have taught you know, 10 plus years in different classes. And so many times our critiques come back to this very simple thing. Um, and people forget about it all the time. We even forget about it while we're designing. Simple things, geometry, gestalt, negative space, moving the eye around, contrast, always can just save your butt when you're in the gym. Um, we, we've been doing book covers for years for a client. I think we've done 36 of them. They're like UX books for uh, user experience handbooks. Always different authors, always different content. 
probably tried three or four different things in the pitch to figure it out. And ultimately, it just came down to these really simple geometric forms that are trying to be elegant, trying to have really nice negative space, and uh, probably came about in a last ditch effort. And I just, I, I always think about that sometimes, that your design fundamentals can really save you. Um, and this client sort of is still with us, and we're still creating all these volumes, and there are all these kind of like riffs on geometry and little, little visual puzzles. Starbucks. <laughs> can I say that? No. I'm unabashedly. Okay. Yeah. What if there was an op if it was just a Starbucks or something? That's it. Yeah. So um, uh, as we've kind of grown up as a design studio, we've realized that uh, strategy and really kind of understanding the client is one of the most important things in the process. We know we can make anything look beautiful, but it doesn't relate to what they need, if it doesn't tell their story. Uh, it, it's, it, the problem goes unsolved. Um, so we had the opportunity to rebrand Saxby's, this was their old um, band. Um, this was a, we'll often do um, not only mood boarding and whatnot, but a lot of strategy uh, for a client. This is a client that actually came to us with full on strategy ready to go. It was like a 50 page deck. Um, we still have to ask the question, like what kind of coffee shop do you want to be? Because if we're going to sit down and, and design it, it might be one thing, but we really needed to know, are you Starbucks? Are you Dunkin'? And they were really kind of cool with saying and owning up to the idea that they're somewhere in between. Um, they wanted to have the unpretentiousness of, of being able to go in and just not worry if somebody's going to make fun of you for wanting an extra pump of vanilla. Um, but they wanted to be a little bit more upscale than, than, than Dunkin'. Um, it was a really nice challenge. Uh, yeah, obviously, you guys have looked like a really popular one here on campus. Should we show them the other, the one that we did? They, um, actually, a former student of ours uh, designed this typeface. Um, we really liked the look of it, and there's some serendipity. Um, they actually kind of gave us the coffee cup in the egg, uh, right down there. So we just kind of copied that shape for the for the, for the coffee cup. Um, we had the opportunity to do, a, to do a lot for them, including having a lot of input on the interiors and, and packaging. One of the hardest things was to actually sell them on um, the pattern. The pattern. I, they, they kept saying, like, this is too, like, Brooklyn hipster. But for us, uh, it felt, I don't know, you, you see people walking around with Wawa um, cups and Dunkin' cups um, and uh, Starbucks cups, and they don't really scream the name, and I feel like we wanted something that as soon as you saw that, it wasn't just a blank color, it was a pattern that you know. If you're familiar with Saxby's, you would know that that's the Saxby's pattern. Um, I feel like a pattern always makes something feel a little bit more like a gift or like a treat. And that's kind of what Saxby's was to us. It was a little bit more of an indulgence of a treat. It was really uplifting. Uh, What's going on? These kind of ones. I don't know. <laughs> It's just that box didn't have their own color. But somebody probably should have checked that at the photo show. <laughs> this was one of the first times where our designs really had an impact on where they went with, with rehabbing a lot of their uh, previous stores and making the look and feel of the, the current, the, the new stores, including the Penn State one uh, here. Um, you know, we were, it was really fun to be able to talk about uh, we're always used to talking about color palette and typography, but what about material palette? Um, brush, metal, and wood, and things like that. So to be able to, to kind of um, team up with their interiors team was really kind of interesting to us. One thing that, they, that they're really big on, and I think we were talking to a couple people today, and maybe it's, it's not really known, um, most of their stores are on college campuses. They're really kind of want to have the, 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 the college community be involved as much as possible. So um, I think that there's probably student-made artwork in this one. Um, can we go to the next slide? But we had an idea that you could do these triptychs, triptych murals where you find three or four different artists um, from the same community. This one we're doing in Philly. It's probably about the size of, actually about the size of, of how it's projected now. Um, and the idea being that every year you could add a new, um, 
illustrator or artist to it by just taking out one of the panels and, and then shipping this panel to the other uh, Saxby's location. So the, the kind of triptych mural would always change. Uh, it's been pretty fun. We've, we've been able to work with seven or eight different illustrators. Um, we give them a template. They're allowed to, to kind of, Saxby's has to stay where it is, obviously, but they're allowed to paint and kind of do whatever they want with it, as long as the, the text stays there, the logo reads, and um, have artwork that kind of changes all the time and is uh, community made. So kin slips um, talk about strategy. Saxby's had their own strategy. Kin slips um, needed us to kind of figure out who, who they were and, and make the strategy for them. So this is a cannabis company. Um, it's on like a Listerine strip, is that what you call it? Yeah. Um, put it on your tongue and, and you're good to go. Um, <laughs> they didn't know who they were, but they knew who their audience was. Yeah, and that was the important thing. They, they figured out that their audience really was, um, like, it sounds weird though, like tech moms? Tech moms, stay-at-home moms, like a Bay Area, That was the demographic they wanted to go after. It was, a, it was an untouched demographic in the cannabis space, as they say. And uh, we figured out that if we could make this cannabis product look like something you find in a health food store, <coughs> that was the way to connect to tech moms. And, and, and going beyond that, how do you package that that tech moms are going to be here? Are we going to continue to say tech moms? <laughs> how are tech moms going to carry this thing around? They don't want to have a they want something that they can conceal, so these are about, we made them about wallet size, they'll fit in your purse. Um, I think like no matter how much changes with the laws in this country and state by state, how that changes, there is something sort of illicit feeling about buying legal cannabis, no matter where you are. So everybody's always trying to find a way to make it uh, pretty or compact or discreet, right? And tech moms are no different. Um, <laughs> So we, we did this like, we commissioned a former student illustrator to do this beautiful botanical pattern. Yeah, somebody asked that today, like us working, even though we make images, do you work with other illustrators? Yeah, we had a student who did beautiful botanical patterns. They were going to do an amazing job way better than we were going to do, so let's get them to do it. And then that's blind, blind letterpress? Yeah, and, and, and doing that wasn't just to waste money, that idea that that Thing was going to be in their purse, you want to be able to reach in and feel around. Hopefully they'll feel the tactile quality on the package and just be able to lift it out. Um, and also, we can spend they have the money to, to, to do better for us. Yeah, you can see some, some close-ups of that. And then lastly, a, a client who was really kind of almost perplexed that we would even suggest strategy. Uh, this is a former EPA, a couple, they were both EPA lawyers. They got fired in the aftermath of Trump's election, um, which is a bummer, but they, being lawyers, they saved a lot of money and wanted to open uh, a, um, a vineyard down outside of DC. I, I'm pretty easy going. I think you were in the office at the time. The, I was almost yelling at, the, at, at this client because he, he kind of didn't understand why we would be asking him what kind of company that he, like what's the, what kind of, What's, what's behind this? Um, he thought that we would just kind of layer on some kind of concept over his, his darling here. Um, and I think it, it, it took like three or four phone calls for him to realize that we were trying to make it personal to him. Like he literally wanted it, was like, why can't you just make it about books or about, about trains? But we could, but like, is, do you have no attachment to this company at all? So I think that's where sometimes you have to make the strategy by yourself without their input. Uh, we were able to kind of get some, some answers out of him about where the vineyard is. It's in this beautiful valley in Shenandoah and just kind of got him to talk about, well, why'd you buy the, why'd you buy the lands? Maybe we can, maybe there's a story there. And they said like they, it was like the last piece of land they saw that day and the sun was setting and there was the beautiful stars in the, in the valley. And like, okay, you guys named it already. The concept's there, let's do it. So it was, just something as simple as, as being having that client be able to invoke to tell a story, even if they don't think it's, it's important, 
led to, I think, a, a pretty beautiful brand where we were able to, to kind of craft a look and feel around their story. These are all um, letterpressed and, and embossed, um, all kind of obviously custom illustration. How are we doing time? This is terrible business advice. Terrible. We've had we worked with consultants every once in a while, try to sharpen, you know, sharpen up our, our strategy, our plan, and they always say this is a bad idea. But we have we have this on our website, and we really believe in this. Um, you know, we talked a few times about how it's important to be sort of humble and check your ego and all that stuff. But having this on our website has um, uh, sent the, the weirdest, most interesting. And I just think that's the best. I think that if you don't like people, it's a, you're going to have a super long, difficult life. Because people are just everywhere. And people are insane. <laughs> and it's the best, right? So that's sort of how we try to be. It's been a long 17 years. Not everybody, not everybody feels that way. But so we put this like front and center on our website as brand positioning about who we are and who we want to work with. And most people don't pay attention to the no feet too big part of it. They pay attention to the, to the no job too small part. Um, but because we've done that, we've, we've gotten some pretty interesting clients. And we've been allowed to sort of grow as a studio because of that. Things that would never usually come our way come our way because of that. Um, this is a cookie factory, in, a cookie company in Brooklyn, a bakery factory. Um, they had a logo. The head baker wanted to be a graphic designer, designed it herself. Those are all terrible, terrible things about clients. Like for the client's a designer, that's really bad. You don't want to work with that person. But we were really interested in her product was great. Uh, she had a loyal following. She had a good name. The name uh, had so many round letters in it. It looked like cookies to us. How could you not have fun with that many O's and G and so that, that became the sort of uh, the crux of the rebrand. And you can't quite see it here because of the projector, but we photographed with the food stylist and photographed these beautiful ice cream sandwich cookies, created a custom pattern out of all the different cookies, and that became like a really low-tech, low-budget packaging system. This is just uh, bakery boxes you buy wholesale and stickers, and every time they send something out the door, whoever's packing it just randomly slaps some stickers on them, and they all look different. Uh, but it gives it that sort of joy and that energy that, that, we, uh, that we wanted. Not a high paying client, not something you think you would want to do when you get that email that says, hey, I'm a former graphic designer, I make cookies. Um, but, we <laughs> <laughs> but, but we did it, and it was really good. Um, she also then sort of pivoted to launch actual like grocery store products, so her ice cream sandwich cookies are going to be in the grocery store. So we got to do, got to do all that photo shoot. Uh, same thing, uh, former architect, uh, know-it-all, super stylish, emails, I don't have a lot of money, I run a gift shop in South Philly, it sounds like a terrible project. But um, we met her, we, we really fell for her, she was really quick, really smart, really stylish, and um, the shop was just filled with stuff, uh, gift wrap, cards, tchotchkes, what, what, what have you. And sometimes that alone, you know, just the environment, people that you meet. Their personality combined with the, their workspace can be enough to, uh, to design the whole project. So we decided to just sort of turn the idea of gift giving, of wrapping paper, of underneath the Christmas tree, birthday party spread, what have you, into the brand itself. So, you know, sort of fancy kind of wedding invitation-ish word mark, but it really comes alive with the, with the whole pattern. Um, you could find interesting little kind of Easter eggs here. It's a candy and bow tie, change purse, all that kind of stuff. Um, and did a full line of wrapping paper, custom bags, that sort of stuff. So I think it's really important to leave the door open, to not be too exclusive, to not sort of turn people away, because you never really know what you're going to get. It's a fine line, I guess, between uh, no job too small, no feet too big, and strangers with candy. Yeah. You have to watch that. Well, and if you're going to take those jobs, they can't just be willy nilly. Like, the reason, there was very specific. Kind of strategic reasons to take these two projects. If they're not going to pay a lot, you know you're still going to have to make it 
great looking because we really don't are in a business to do garbage design. So, okay, this is an opportunity to do to do pattern, and maybe that's going to go somewhere for us. Or with the with the cookie one, it was the opportunity to to really kind of get more into packaging and more into the photo styling and kind of round that part of the portfolio out. Um, so there's there's always reasons to do that stuff. And we're not just going to say yes to everything. Last one. So last slide. Last section. So last slide. Lesson. If you will. Last section. Be good. Um, I don't know. You guys don't, you don't agree with me? You don't feel this? <laughs> <laughs> you can eat spaghetti without Parmesan cheese, but why would you want to? <laughs> I think graphic design is the same way. I think as a student coming out of college, you have to earn that trust. It takes time. You have to be really um, down to do whatever your art director or your team, whatever agency you work at throws your way, you've got to be really committed to the work ethic and the time. But if you do that and you start to build trust and you understand that you have to trust your clients, that they know a lot about their business, but that you want your clients to trust you, that you know a lot about your business, then I think that's like a, I don't know, a nice flexibility and meatballs. It's pretty good. Um, you hope that if you do it long enough, you get a client who's going to trust you continuously and come back to you and really let you do your thing, whatever that is. Um, we were approached by Paul Buckley, really fantastic art director at Penguin. He's been there for, I think he's been there maybe 30 years, 25 years, I'm not sure. Uh, he's overseen so many amazing books. And Penguin Classics is always repackaging uh, classic books that you sort of grow up with reading. He came to us with, with the uh, pretty intimidating assignment to redo John Steinbeck. Um, maybe that's one of the first books you read uh, in junior high. I guess it certainly was for me. I think we were super intimidated by that fact that it is kind of like uh, that maybe a teenager is like entry into literature in some ways. You know, a couple of the sort of key books that we get exposed to. But also because of this, like, have you seen this and uh, seen this around? Um, there used to be this thing called bookstores. Uh, Barnes and Noble have like giant blow-ups of these things, and uh, it's pretty iconic. And so our first instinct was sort of, I don't know, like I don't want to touch that. That's kind of perfect. How are we going to do it? But Paul really trusted us to do our thing. He trusted that we were the right fit for this assignment, um, so that we could kind of update this for a new for a new generation. So we set out to recreate this. So what do you have here? You have you have the environment, the landscape that's hugely important in all Steinbeck stories. You have the, 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 uh, the comparison of the kind of human form with the landscape, the landscape dwarfing the person in a lot of ways. Um, and you have the implication of a journey and choices that have to be made. And right there is kind of the recipe. You don't have to, you don't have to fix it if it's not broken. And so we, we kind of set out to do our version of that. And I don't think, you know, without Paul's trust, there's no way we would have, we would have had the confidence or even the, the, the sort of uh, energy in you need those kinds of clients. You have to have clients that trust you or else you become a pair of hands and it's just like not fun anymore if that's the case. Um, and these are the four that we did.
it's a small studio, um, it's vital for us to kind of keep, I don't want, again, I don't want to say reinvention because I think that's too extreme and too kind of calculated, but just kind of pushing and, and making ourselves new so what you saw five years ago, you might be, if you hadn't seen us for five years, you might be surprised what we're doing now, but it still kind of feels like it's from the same end. Um, yeah, I think school is just the, the beginning of kind of learning how to do that stuff. So we're always trying to push it a little bit. Let's go all the way back and we'll come forward. Right. How should we define the relationship between design, graphic design and illustration, or even the graphic design and art? You hear that? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I heard you. Uh, how do I define the difference between graphic design and illustration like, versus fine art? Yeah, it's like the relationship between these three disciplines. Because I see they're all connected, but they're different in some way. How do you define your, like, in your perspective, how do you define the relationship between these three? Yeah, they're definitely connected, and I think that some of the, some of like my favorite graphic design is inspired, so it's my favorite illustration is very inspired by modern art and by modern artists. And, uh, everybody's ripping off Matisse forever. You know? um, but I guess for us, it's really about the client. It's about sort of solving that problem. And it's not so much about like an internal expression or an internal uh, message that we want to communicate. We get a lot of personal satisfaction out of that combination of art and commerce, but it's never just about the pure pursuit of the fine arts. Did I answer the right question, actually? Is that what you're asking? Um, yeah. I think also that the, that relationship for us between design and illustration um, brings a kind of human organic quality to our design work. Um, I think we could design great things with just type, and there's certainly schools and schools of thought or Swiss design where it's just grids. But that for us, that feels a little bit dead and maybe not so active. I think when we're able to bring illustration in or when it Great illustration is paired with great design. It feels a lot more human, and especially in this kind of super high-tech mechanical age, that idea of the human element in there, I think it's, it's pretty important when you're able to bring it in. So we're, you know, we're Tyler guys, and there's a lot of similarities in the program that we study in to the sort of Penn State model. And not all schools are like that. I don't think that's something I knew as a student until I sort of got out there and studied. I, I taught a class at MICA, I taught at UArts. And some schools have that really like Swiss European approach to design. But Tyler was like this uh, salon style, like 1960s combined design and illustration together. Yeah, there's always a hybrid there. And the studios that, that did that kind of work were always the things that we gravitated towards and were interested in. But it was also the kind of stuff that our professors were pushing on us. So I think our work leans that way just because that's how we were taught. I was wondering how you guys showed
it, it is a timing. It really is. At the end of the day, it's a timing issue. Just if we were collaborating on everything, nothing would get done. Somebody in the. Um, what do you guys personally do when you're working on a project and you get stuck? Go to the movies. That's probably the thing I can do. Yeah. Just walk away from it. I mean, obviously if it's on a deadline, it's, it's hard and it becomes really stressful, but I always feel like just walking away and just taking a day or two off from it to, to not think about it, come back and you have a little bit different point of view. I think that's the great thing about working with a, with a team. You guys experience this probably in the studio. There's, there's five other people that, that can look at it and maybe if I get stumped, even if they've got a little bit of extra work to do, you know, somebody's got a great idea that can push this thing along. Um, what else? Well, I do think that that sort of like half-joking slide about like design fundamentals, I really think it's true. Um, when I get stuck or I get lost on a project, it's often because I wasn't sure what I was trying to say in the first place, or because it's too cluttered, or there's not good organization, or it, it depends on what, the, what you're stumped at it's more execution or if it's more conceptual. But we draw all the time, going back to sketches and saying, what was I trying to say here? What is, what is the whole point of this? Should it be energetic and, and busy? Should it be quiet? Those kinds of questions, I think, really help you. You know, they, they might not shake a new idea loose, but they might help you clarify uh, and, and sort of edit out some of the things that are distracting. We still have that giant you know, card deck. Oh yeah, there's a couple of those things, right? Where it's like um, systems. It's like systems to get you to think. There's a web app for it too. I mean, he's like a electronic artist from dating back to the '70s, but he has this deck of cards, and there's literally I have a bookmark. I'll send it to you in case you get stumped. I'll send it to you too. Uh, that's just prompts, and it'll come up on your screen. And it'll say, "Make it red," and maybe you'll experiment with that, or like do the opposite of what you were doing. Um, I don't use it often, but Sometimes if it's just a prompt from somewhere else that you would never think to do, like at least it's going to spark some kind of uh, exercise to, to kind of go in a different direction. Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, a lot of your political arts industry really uh, captures sort of a national mood in a very concise and precise way. So I'm just wondering if you talk a little bit about how you use like, formal and design elements to kind of tap into the political context of this like, national mood. Let me sure I understand the question. Um, how do we use formal elements of design? Yeah, like so they have a lot of uh, poster, for example, and they're simple ways to really like capture a moment, like capture this national mood, this political sort of atmosphere. And so what was your thought process kind of like how did you how did you get there using you know formal elements? I mean it's a lot of just um, that thought process stuff is is really just a lot of sketchbook, but also word association. Um, and the word association, I think, is really big. Um, you know, for Obama or whatever, um, you might start with two ideas, um, you know, rebuilding and then America. So those are two. Going off from there, what is rebuilding? Is it um, construction? I mean, obviously not when we got to a point where it was, you know, putting up new wallpaper. And then the flag on this side seemed to match up good. So a lot of just kind of free word association. We were talking about it a little bit earlier today. I feel like a lot of them are super simple solutions, but I think the simplest solutions like take forever to, to kind of figure out. It's never like, oh, let's do, do some wallpaper with a bomb. <laughs> I, I think beyond that too, this is probably not about like formal things, but trying to identify what the tone you're going for is. Like I think a lot of our things can be like tone pieces in that way. Um, that particular article wasn't just about the inauguration. It wasn't like he did it. It wasn't that. It was actually trying to look at the huge task he had ahead of him and what these policies, you know, how he actually would conquer this. And so we wanted it to be a little bit hopeful. But there was a little bit of this like sense of scale that had to be there. You know that this it was this big thing he really had to do, and that it was almost in his, you know, within his reach, but maybe beyond his grasp. Uh, there's that aspect. What's the tone? I think I think that 
just like an execution standpoint, even though a lot of those illustrations and designs and book covers look simple, I think that the fundamentals that you learn in design school are, are really present there, more so than we'd like to admit. Like the idea of movement or scale is a huge thing, moving the eye up and down. I mean, it's, it's kind of second nature to us now, but it's always like, oh yeah, I did that. And, and you kind of just, it's second nature. You, you didn't do it on purpose, but it's always there scale or color or just a surprising contrast it can kind of create its own mood without even having to have specific imagery. Um, over here. Um, you guys said beware of strangers with candy. Um, is there a way to like, know that someone's just like, things with candy? There definitely are uh, like red flags about certain clients, for sure. You learn those over time. Um, if people are really bad at getting back to you, if it's like this dream client, you start to say to yourself, no, it's going to be fine. Really good. But they're not getting back to you. Um, it's weird. Vetting clients is a lot like dating. <laughs> There's no major warning signs, right? Um, you know, do they ask you questions? Do they want to know about your process? It's kind of really important things to look out for. It should feel really good, but it should also have a sense of organization and respect and forward movement and, you know, people really trust you. Those, those are all, yeah, it's, it's actually a good way of a lot of dating. You never realize that? <laughs> Unlike dating, like, also too sometimes. Like, like the decision makers, if you're walking in and they say, well, we got 15 people that, that need to sign off on this, it might not be a reason to to walk away from the project, but it is something that you know in your back pocket, okay, that's gonna be a little bit of an issue once it's time to, so it's not always just like saying no, but at least it's going in armed with knowing what your road bumps are gonna be. Um, yeah, we said it like if we, going back, we would still do that crazy John Mathis project. We would still do that. It's a great story. It was super stressful at the time, but you do, you do do that stuff sometimes anyway, and you learn, but what's the, what's the warning sign? It happened the other day. Um, like, like a week or two ago, it was like, but oh, don't worry, I'm going to hook you up with all this. Uh, that's we don't have a lot of money, but it, you're going to get a lot of you're going to get a lot of publicity. Out of this. The prom the promise of like future something, like in lieu of the present. Don't worry, we're going to do something later. Yeah, like cool, still do it, but don't don't assume there's going to be anything later. Uh, right. I mean, and part of the point of that of that whole little part also was like. Sometimes somebody may have a lot of money, but it's not a reason to actually do it, do the project, because there's probably um, a lot of downside to it. I'm just talking to myself now. I definitely think if, if when we become a pair of hands, like when that happens, when trust sort of arose, you're not getting paid for it. But there's times where you're just too far into something and you are providing a service. We, Dusty uses the, the analogy of like, this is like carpentry. <coughs> the design is about like, you're providing a service for somebody. They want you to build something. They need it. You want to build it your way and you want to put your spin on it. Um, but you do still have to deliver. So we, don't, we try not to fire that many clients or draw the line all that much. We hope that through a little bit of diplomacy, you can kind of talk about it and say, we don't think this is working. And you know, I think if there is respect and trust, you can, you can get a lot of progress out of that. But yeah, if you feel like you're becoming a pair of hands, if you don't feel like you're getting paid for what was agreed upon, you know, that's why contracts are so great, learning that whole sort of business and design thing. There's lots of ways to protect yourself in those situations. It's also really emotional for us, so it's really hard to want to let go. Like, we just want to make this thing look great, so if they're not if they're not happy, oh man, we're in the sixth round, but I really want to get this thing going. But if it's the sixth round, something's going on. And, and a lot, honestly, like a lot of the time, it's, it's not just them, it's us. Like maybe we just aren't handling them right because we just want to, we just want to make them happy, but making them happy isn't going to make for a great design. So it's kind of like, it goes around and around. I want to get a picture of you. It's like, you know, you're just like,
how much, especially when you guys have been in work working together, how much unfiltered or how much humor, even if it ends up being a serious piece, how much does that play into your process? <coughs> pretty, pretty big part. Yeah, especially in the beginning, especially with the illustration work. We were talking about it in the gallery, there's a couple of pieces in there that, like there's one that we did on the phone together, just like throwing some ideas around back and forth and 45 minutes later it's done. Um, sometimes the limitations of communication actually make you focus more and, you know, kind of cut out some of the mindlessness. There's stuff in there that I drew on a bar napkin having a margarita that then he illustrated. So there's, it's like unspoken, that happens sometimes too. But we do have our studio, for better or worse, it's an open room with everybody in it. So uh, everybody can sort of contribute a joke or another take on something or uh, a completely different take on something, which can be frustrating. Um, we do try to hire people that we would want to hang out with or at least um, be surprised by. You know, have something offer a sense of humor or offer a personality that isn't there. And that's been really good to us. Seth? <laughs> no, no, I totally agree. I'm just, I, I feel like there's almost like, almost like an unspoken thing. Um, it's probably, you know, having a lot of the same interests, and I think that goes into, you know, making sure that the, this, the three other people in the studio kind of fit through it as well, so that banter and that kind of shorthand can go around the room and not just limit to he and I. Second question. Yeah. Um, you guys talked about it at the beginning, it was like a side project. What did you guys do before that? Were you at so uh, we graduated right before September 11th. Yeah. We got jobs after September 11th. The economy kind of crashed. There wasn't a lot going on. I worked at a real small book publisher in, in Philly. It's kind of a funny story. If you go to Barnes and Noble um, and you see the, uh, the, fifth, like the clearance books, that are like the big picture books. The company that I worked for designed those books. Like they were designed to be 50% off. They were never full price. They were always just like <laughs> planes from World War II, kind of stuff like that. So it was, it was cool to kind of just learn the process, but it was not a super challenging job. And um, I think that, that was, it was good because it made me still be kind of keyed up to be able to do stuff after work. I think if if we had super creative jobs during the day for those first couple of years, I don't think that we would have the energy to, to come out afterwards and be able to, to kind of collaborate. I worked for a yeah, really super small design studio with like three people. And on my first day, I figured out that I had to answer the phone and do the packages, like send out the mail and take out the trash and do the design and all that stuff. And after about a year of that, uh, my super, super awesome very opinionated boss said to me, uh, you're very opinionated and you should probably work for yourself. And I realized that she was, she was right, but that also in the year that I'd been with her, she gave me a lot of those tools to in fact work for myself because she had her staff do a little bit of everything. So super small design student that I learned so much in that first year. Yeah, those, those first jobs are important even if they're not like the home run superstar jobs. It's, 